But I do hold this following guest to a high standard. He's, of course, uh, I don't even know what his title is, editor, staff writer, all the things that he does, poster, internet guy, Dan Salamone. He joins us right now. Uh, we haven't heard from Dan in about a month because we're all crazy busy with draft stuff and other things as well. But now he joins us for his weekly spot to ask Paul, Lance, and I hopefully some very tough and interesting questions. Mr. Salamone, happy Friday to you, sir. Hey, how are we doing, guys? We're good, Hi, man. Doing so, well, Dan. Dan, uh, we're, we're out of draft season. Uh, have you recovered from the fact that the Giants did not draft anyone from Ohio State? Yeah, or sign them, yeah. This is, it's getting a little out of control these days. Well, on the bright we side, to... they, were, they didn't bring in any Michigan guys or yeah. Penn State guys or Michigan State guys, so I guess that helps a little bit, right? Okay. Uh, I still have Big Ten pride, so I, I would have had to deal with that. Very good. All right, you got some probing questions for us, Mr. Salamone. I do. It is a Friday, so I thought we'd start off with a little fact or fiction. How do you guys feel about that? Awesome. All right. Um, as you guys know, we play Kansas City and the Buccaneers. It's the first time the Giants have played the previous Super Bowl um, champion. It's the first time since 2000. And my fact or fiction statement to you is Kansas City will be the tougher matchup than Tampa Bay. Lance, why don't you take that one first? I'll go fiction on this. I think Tampa Bay is the more difficult matchup because I just think the Bucks, Dan, it's a more balanced team. And I'm going based on, of course, what they're bringing back. I would say the Bucks' defense poses a bigger challenge on all three levels. Their secondary was very strong last year. They got some production out of the young guys. We know their linebacking core is one of the best, and they pretty much brought back everybody up front. So I don't think Kansas City's defense, at least as it stands right now, based on what they're bringing back, matches Tampa Bay. So unless there's a major injury or a huge development, I would say as it stands right now, the Week 11 matchup with Tampa Bay much tougher than Kansas City. Paul, how about you? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Lance based on the rosters and the personnel. But then again, Tom Brady's 43 years old, and I could have sworn last year he was not going to make it through the season. And somehow that Buccaneers offensive line not only kept him upright but did a sensational job and played so far better than I think anybody could have expected. Can they do that again in 2021? I'm not so sure that I would bet that Brady gets through the full season healthy. And since the Giants don't play Tampa until the middle of the schedule, in fact, it's right after the Giants' bye week in Week 10, I'm going to suggest that maybe Brady isn't available to play that game, and it makes it an easier game for the Giants. And even though Kansas City does not have the defensive personnel that Tampa does, they've got one Steve Spagnuolo who everybody knows I have the utmost respect for. So I'm going to let my heart kind of get in the way here, too. And I'm going to say that Kansas City is the tougher opponent of the two. The Chiefs' regular season success since Pat Mahomes has become their starter has been unprecedented. I mean, it's just they're great every year, and they're very difficult to beat. He provides challenges that the Bucks offense does not just from his skill set. The Giants played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers very close last year. They were extremely competitive. Now, I do think the Bucs were a much better team by the end of the year than they were the week they faced the Giants. But I think the Giants also, that was the start of their improvement uh, against that Bucs team. But I'm going to go with the Chiefs, and, and I'll throw in this reason. Now, look, you can't go wrong. Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, right? But <laughs> I think it's a lot more difficult to win in Kansas City than it is to win in Tampa Bay. That's very true, John. Because you know that in that Tampa Bay stadium, even though all those fans are jacked up because of the Super Bowl and all that stuff, there are going to be at least 20,000 Giant fans in that building. They will find their way in, they'll get there, and they're going to be wearing their blue jerseys, and they're going to be rooting for the Giants. I promise you that. Besides, it's, yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough. Do you know how many Giant fans are going to be in that Kansas City Stadium Bowl? couple thousand maybe because chief fans are legit and they are going to be at that game at a night game and they are going to be loud and that place is a really tough place to win the bucks game is off a bye which does give that a little bit of an edge don't care i think the chiefs game is a little bit tougher because these super bowl champions always seem to have a little bit of a dip in their year after winning so i'm gonna go with the chiefs but it's close i think also tampa bay you got to take into consideration it's going to have a lot more continuity on both sides of the ball this year. Remember, they were all learning everything new on offense last year with Brady at the controls. And I think even if you go back to that Giants matchup, they were still getting a feel for one another. Remember, they clicked coming off of their late 13 bye, 
and did not lose a game after that all the way into the playoffs. So the reason why I'm even more confident in the Bucks this season, I think by the time week 11 rolls around, just imagine where their offense is going to be in their comfort level compared to where it was last year in week number 11. All right, Danny, question two. Number two, who is going to be the toughest challenge in the NFC East? One of my favorite stats is it hasn't been a repeat champion uh, since Eagles won four in a row in the early 2000s. Who's the biggest challenger this year? Yeah, we just talked about Andy Reid with the Chiefs, right? Well, the last time you had an NFC East re- repeat was Andy Reid and Donovan McNabb mm-hmm. with the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, a lot of our younger fans probably don't even remember that, that are listening to this podcast or listening live right now. So that's a good question, Dan. And I think you could take this a bunch of different ways, but I'm always going to come back to the quarterback position because it's the most important position on the field. And I'm going to go with Dallas just because I know, I know the Dallas offense is going to be really good. Now, if their offensive line gets hurt again and falls apart, sure. But I I can't predict injuries. I don't know what's going to happen there. So I'm not going to predict that. I know the Dallas offense is going to be really, really good, probably a top five, six unit in the league. Now, their defense was a mess last year, and there's a chance that it's just as bad this year. Dan Quinn hopes to replace that. Uh, They've drafted a million players on defense to hope to fix that. It's close. I can make the same warrant for Washington, right? We know Washington's defense is going to be really good. We just don't know about their offense with Ryan Fitzpatrick. You can make the same argument, and it's a fair one. But I'm going to go with Dallas just because I have the most faith in Dak Prescott as compared to the other quarterbacks in the division. So I'm going to go with Dallas. Paul, how about you? Well, when you play the percentages, I will always go with the team that's got the better defense first. So for me, I think the Cowboys are a solid third-place team. Philadelphia, I'm already writing them off. Uh, they know that they're in a rebuilding mold, and it's going to be a couple of years, and they got to get themselves a quarterback anyway. Paul, you anyway. just kiss to death this whole thing. You so, just so rode off the Eagles in May. Philly now they're going to win. Place team. Now they're going to win ten games and win the yeah, division, and exactly. it's going to be all your fault. I know, and I'll, and I'll, <laughs> and I'll take the rap. I'll take it if that's what happens. But I see, I see they are they are guaranteed fourth place. Dallas is a solid third place team. This thing is between the Giants and the Washington Football Team, and I don't think there's much doubt in my mind about that at all. Well, if you look at recent history, it's very rare that a team completely eliminates itself from the conversation, especially early in the season. I think the Eagles are going to be that quiet, tricky team that everybody writes off, and they remain competitive. I don't think they're going to win the division. I think they have the most question marks, but they're still the land of the unknown. New scheme, and remember, that actually turned out to be a benefit this past season with the division. Everything was new in Washington, and they wound up winning it all. So I'm not so quick to dismiss Philadelphia. I think it comes down to Dallas and Washington. Dak Prescott's by far the best proven quarterback in the division. I don't think there's any debate from that standpoint, at least from a consistency. But Washington has the better defense, so you could easily make arguments for both sides of the ball. I'll go with Dallas mainly because until somebody wins back-to-back division titles, how could you bet with Washington? The history books are against them. It would be in favor of Dallas more so winning the division than it would be Washington, unless this unbelievable drought comes to an end. So I'll give Dallas the slight edge. Their offense is not the concern. The question is, can their defense improve? I think their defense can improve. And if you slightly improve that Dallas defense, that makes that team that much more dangerous. You know, fellas, what I find really odd about this is that you're both ignoring the two biggest issues here against Philadelphia. One is quarterback. They obviously have the worst quarterback position in the in the whoa, conference whoa, whoa, in the, in the whoa, division. Hold on a second. I agree with you, Paul. If I was to pick right now, I would put Philadelphia in fourth place. Okay. I agree okay. with you. Yeah, right, I wasn't picking cool. Philadelphia to win. I made that clear. And but I just said I, you're sort of completely dismissing them, at least my interpretation of well, what you said. Let's put it I would have completely dismissed them. We spent the whole them. year talking about how new coaching staffs under the protocols and pandemic rules, which are still in place right now, they're not a whole lot different than what they were last year. They've inched a little bit closer to normalcy, but not much. And we talked about what a detriment it was for all of the first-year coaching staffs last season to try to, 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 to you know, get out of that quagmire. Now, Washington did win the division with a new coaching staff, but look what they did it with, a seven-win season. So, no, I think Philadelphia has tremendous hurdles to overcome. Oh. They're, they're the fourth-place team. No, Paul, I agree. If, if you were to predict right now, that would be the fourth-place team. I was just teasing you because of your certainty that you were putting the hex on the whole well, thing. It's, it's, it's you but know, he, Here's the other factor. Washington started three different quarterbacks last year and still managed to win the division. Granted, it was a down year. That's another reason why, once again, I'm not dismissing Philadelphia simply because 
Jalen Hurts, people don't have an overwhelming amount of confidence. I'm not saying they should, but there's also not much known about Jalen Hurts and how he'll function within this offense or whether or not that is the guy. I don't know. Maybe they go in a different direction. Maybe they go with Joe Flacco to start the season. Who knows at this point? Now, that's going to go real well for them, won't it? Now, the interesting thing here, guys, that I think is fascinating is the schedules. Because if you take a look at this, Philadelphia to start the year, the schedule makers are not kind to them. At Atlanta, home versus the Niners. At the Cowboys, home versus the Chiefs. At the Panthers, home versus the Bucks. Those are the first six games. So they could easily, Paul, be one and five out of the sure. games. Sure. Sure. And then at Oakland, by the way, is their next game. And they may be on their third quarterback, Jamie Newman, by the time they get to Week 10. Yeah, look, exactly. So, look, I'm with you. I think that could be a real problem. Now, the opposite here is Dallas. Other than that Bucs game to start the year, they don't play a team that made the playoffs Mm -hmm. last year. That's true. Until November 21st. That's true. And and I have all three schedules up right here. So, after the Bucs, Dallas gets at L.A., home versus Philly, home versus Carolina, home versus Giants, at New England, at Minnesota, home versus Denver, home versus Atlanta. So those are a lot of winnable games. Now, obviously, they're going to win all those games. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. That's the way the you know cookie crumbles. But they have the chance to get off to a fast start. And just for fairness, Washington starts home versus the Chargers, home versus the Giants, at Buffalo, at Atlanta, home versus the Saints, home versus the Chiefs, at Packers, at Broncos, home versus the Bucks. So... I would say those two teams probably have much tougher schedules to start the year Agreed. than, than Dallas does. So I think if you're talking midseason, just based off the schedules, Dallas would probably be in the best position. The problem is that Dallas has just a nightmare gauntlet to end the year with a bunch of really, really good teams. So and I think it'll be a, one of those divisions where we get swings based on opponent strength of schedule throughout the year. But I think, look, you can make an argument for Dallas's offense or you can make an argument for – Washington's defense, and I think both are, are pretty valid. Well, Dan, could what, we, could we all agree, though, that, that the Giants and Washington clearly have the two best defenses in the division? Yes. And and I still go with the core belief that defense, if you're going to flip a coin, you got to always favor the defense. Well, but once again, you also need to score points. And I think that was proven last year within this division, too. And the Giants, if we're at least going to look through this lens, we want to see an improvement and not just a field goal improvement, but almost near a well, touchdown improvement. Which, so, team, which team won the division last year? The team with the best defense. Well, right. But, right? but, 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 Paul, but Washington also defense was able to manufacture points, though, as well. No, defense Paul, is what won the Paul, division. I, I agree. I agree. But if Dak Prescott is healthy, how many more wins do the Cowboys have? Don't know how that defense is going to come together with a bunch of new no, no, points. No, 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 no. But they're going to no, manufacture but, but more points. No, no, but though. Paul, here's my point. Yeah, but if they lose no, 38 to 35, Paul, what does it Paul, matter? Paul, 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 you, you, you skipped my question. We know Dallas's defense was historically bad last year, right? Right. But if you put Prescott in there for 16 games last year instead of five, what do they get? Two more wins? Yeah. And does that win the division? Uh, I see your point. That's my point. I see so their point. defense can still be terrible, right? They could still be terrible and, and still And they can wind still be around 500. Uh, so again, that's why but that's why I picked them third instead of fourth. Oh no, and 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 and, and I <laughs> and I think you would say they were their Dallas would probably be closer to Washington and New York than to Philly, right? Yes. Okay. I think that's more than fair. Dan, what do you think? I'm, I think I'm leaning toward Paul here. I think Washington, I think until somebody knocks them off. I think they've been, we talked about giant stockpiling picks for the future. They've been stockpiling first rounders on that defense. And with Ron Rivera, I think they're going to be the, the toughest out this year of the, of the three NFC East opponents. Very good. All right, Dan, question three. All right, last, last schedule one. Uh, giants head back to New Orleans, which the last time was that incredible game between Breeze and Manning, mm. 13 combined touchdowns. That had me thinking, what's the most memorable regular season game you guys have covered? Oh, boy. Now, this is one I wish I had some time for to think about. Most unbelievable regular season game. <laughs> the good one? Probably this two. I remember the JPP blocked field goal against Dallas. That was a really good game. The end of game, end of season game against Carolina. Um, to I think that was to make it into the playoffs, Paul. Right? Yeah. That was a that really was good when regular they ran season crazy game. On yeah, they ran for like yeah. three hundred yards. That was a really fun game. <sighs> Boy, all right. 
Paul, if you have one in your holster, do you want to go I uh, give this some more thought? Well, the problem with that is, you know, I'm, I'm entering my 39th yes, season. Yes, you have a lot of years going So, I mean, I could literally pick two dozen games and not differentiate between any of them. But if you really wanted to force me to go for one, probably Tiki Barber's 200-yard game that honored Wellington Mara after Mr. Mm. Mara passed away at the Meadowlands. That's a good one. Uh, that, that was emotionally a very, very difficult game for me because I was so close to Mr. Mara. And his whole family was there. And it was, I mean, you know, it was very, very difficult, you know, that that game because of the circumstances. And they had put his picture up on the scoreboard. And it was, uh, it was just, it just ripped your guts out, you know, because he wasn't there anymore. And Tiki just went absolutely bonkers. And then he gave the uh, one after he, he ran for one of the big touchdowns in the game. He gave the game ball to uh, to Wells' grandson. So for that reason, I'm going to bring that one up. How about you, Lance? Well, I would put the Saints Giants game that Dan referenced at the top of the list. I don't think anything tops that. I mean, that was remarkable to see 13 combined passing touchdowns in that game and just a crazy back and forth effort, and then ultimately a crazier ending. So, I mean, that to me will always be at the top of the list. I'll say a close second would be in the 2011 season, the game against New England in the regular season when Manning hit Jake Ballard for the go-ahead game-winning touchdown, and they squeaked out the 24-20 victory. That was also a very entertaining affair that I think deserves consideration. Is it wrong that I'm going to take, like, the Bill Parcells path here, and I think Paul knows what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I remember the bad ones more than I do the good ones. (laughs) No, I do. It's like okay. th- th- those are the ones that I remember, and they stick with you, right? I mean, they, they just oh. stick in the side. They just—it's like a shiv in your side, and it's just there, and you can't get rid of it. Those are the ones that I remember. I, I mean, the Matt Dodge game is just one that you want to slam your face against the wall. Mm-hmm. But I, and look, maybe it's Al a Toon beating Tom Flynn in the end zone. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you go back. You know what other game sticks out for me? Only because I remember afterwards what the panic was. The 2007 Eli Manning game against the Vikings, where he oh. just kept throwing it to him again and again. Sharper. Yeah, Darren Sharper killed him. Yeah. Uh, that's a game that, that sticks in my head. And for some reason, those bad games. And, you know, the other game that sticks in my head, too, it was a loss, but in the end it was a good game, is the final regular season game against the Patriots when they're undefeated. Mm-hmm. That, that's a game that I remember Historic. really well. Yeah, because people were, you know, were talking, are the Giants going to play anybody going in? And Tom Coffin throws down the gauntlet. We're playing people. We're trying to win the game. And it was a really, really fun game, too. So those are the ones that, that kind of stick out for me. How about you, Danny? Personally, I think uh, Eli's last start at home, just because I, I had a cool assignment for that game. I was kind of undercover. That's right. Back, kind of the, the crew on the sidelines, so I got to do a cool feature. Just seeing that from the sideline and then the emotion of just watching it play out. When you're on the sideline, you know, as you guys know, you don't really know exactly everything that's going on they're talking about on TV. But just watching that play out in real time was very, very special. And watching him, you know, run out, um, run into the tunnel um, and greet his family after the game, that was definitely a memorable one for that me. That was very cool. That, 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 that is a really good one, Dan. All right, question four. All right, last one. Switching gears, rookie minicamps. I know they're not going to be showing you the playbook today, but what are you guys looking for? Um, they're also be meeting with the media. We'll hear from Coach Judge. Uh, what do you guys think about that? I just want to see the guys move around. You know, the, the the sad thing is that we didn't have a chance to go to the Senior Bowl this year, Dan. That's something me and you usually get to do every year, so we actually get to see these guys, you know, fairly close. You know, you sit in the front of the stands. You're, what, like 50 feet away from these guys, you know, 20, 30 yards. It's, you're pretty close, and you get to see how these guys move. Now, we got to watch it on tape this year. It's not the same, you know. At the Combine, you don't get to see him work out up close, but at least you get to walk up to him at the podium and you can see their body type up close. Like, I still remember when we were at the Combine and I went to Saquon Barkley's podium, and I remember tweeting this out. His legs were like oak trees. <laughs> they were just gigantic, and you don't have a feel for that until you're next to the guy, right? Now, we're not going to be that close to these guys this week to get that impression because of the restrictions that are still in place that hopefully, God willing, will be gone in a few months. But I just want to see these guys move around, see their athleticism in person. Hopefully we'll get some full-speed drills. I don't think we're going to get a lot of team stuff, but if we get some full-speed drills just to see these guys move, that's that's kind of what I'm looking forward to because, it, Paul, there's nothing like seeing these guys up close and personal 
to get a feel for what they look like athletically. John, you know how important rookie minicamp is to me. I pick out my dark horse undrafted rookie free agent to make the team every spring. I can't do that this time because we're not going to see plays. The Giants are going to have 22 players, supposedly, out on the field today. And it's only going to be for an hour today and an hour tomorrow. And from what I understand, it's going to be mostly coaches' instructions and maybe some positional drills. That's it. They're not even going to do snaps. So, you know, how can how can I digest any of this? No, for me, it's just being able to get back to the facility because the pandemic rules have forced us away to get back to the facility, to get back on the patio, to get back to see these guys on the field in a helmet, in a jersey. That gets me pumped up. But in terms of being able to digest anything, I just don't know that there's going to be anything to really digest. Yeah, I would echo Paul's sentiments. I don't think there's really going to be anything to digest. Let's face it. There's only so much you can take away from two hours worth of practice over the course of two days and tell me that that's going to apply to what we're going to see in the regular season. I think if there's any guy in particular, just to see up close and personal, it would be Ellerson Smith because he didn't play at all last season. So considering he didn't have any film to look at of 2020 games, that would be the one player, if you would ask me to hone in on who I think is worth seeing up close and personal, just to see him run around, how he looks, because it's been quite some time since he's actually been in a situation where he's even run drills in a team setting. But outside of that, everybody else has pretty much been on the field or in some type of a game situation throughout the course of 2020. So Ellerson Smith, to me, is the guy to watch if you're going to put anyone under the magnifying glass. And I'm going to throw in how advanced Paul's tan is on May 14th would be my other thing I'm really looking forward to seeing. I'm doing pretty well, John. <laughs> I'm sure you are. You'll, you'll see me in a couple of hours. I'm doing pretty well. Yes, right now, Paul and I are still in our basements, but we will be at the facility at around 2 o'clock to, to get this thing started. All right, Dan, yeah. you, anything left to add? Well, I, I just want to say thanks to Lance and Paul. We're trying to drive some traffic to Giants.com, so I think they, they thoroughly did, they did the opposite of us. Well, Jan, I was, but, uh, funny. I was going to say the same thing, but make sure, don't, don't miss all the can't miss coverage on Giants.com. Check it out. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I don't know, yeah. But along those lines, in terms of excitement, how about I leave you with one more? Which mid to late round pick are you guys? Do you guys think could have a legitimate impact on this team this year? Whew. Mid, you would say after third round, you wouldn't count Aaron Robinson. Yeah, that? start starting with the third round. How about that? Starting well, if with you the go third late round. round. Don't you automatically have to go third day only? No, I mean, I mean, Dan said mid, mid, to, mid late. to late, round. mid to late, mid to late. mid to late. Yeah, I. I that you think will have an impact right away. That's interesting. Or in the long term. Or in the long run. Do you that way? <laughs> well, that changes things that up. That changes everything. Well, I am, I, I'm, I'm going to steal Lance's answer for this one. I'm going to go with Ellerson Smith just because I think he has the body type for it. He has the athleticism for it. If he can figure things out, uh, I think Ellerson Smith is the easy answer here. So uh, I'm going to go there more long term. I think he could be a designated pass rusher on passing downs a little bit as a rookie, depending on where he's at. But I think long-term, it's Ellerson Smith. You know, the interesting part about this, John, and I look at Ellerson Smith and I say to myself, at the very least, right, you think if he's going to get a uniform on game day, he's going to be on special teams. And I remember how Kerry Wynn, as a defensive edge rusher and a lineman, That's a good one. made a really good name for himself on special teams, even though he wasn't initially part of the defensive line rotation. And it wasn't showing up in the box score. You know, you didn't see splash plays. But the coaches kept telling you, Kerry Wynn is just kicking butt on special teams. So I wonder if Ellerson Smith, at the very least, if he doesn't put up any stats on the defensive side of the line of scrimmage, is going to give the Giants some really good special teams play that the common folks won't even notice. And then, Lance, I would say, too, look, Aaron Robinson's the obvious one that would help sure. now. You step in, you know, compete with Darnay Holmes in the slot. Yeah, but, I mean, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the draft because, I mean, I think that was the whole heart of Dan's question. I think along the same lines that Paul was going with special teams, if Gary Brightwell makes the team, and I'm sure he's got a good chance of being the third running back, you know, that's a guy that could step on the field day one and contribute to all four special teams units. So, you know, that would be a guy that I would point to where you're not worried about what he's going to do on offense or defense, but you know there's going to be a place for him on special teams, and you know he's got the enthusiasm and the passion for it. So I think that would be a guy that 
that could make an immediate impact because he could play all four teams. He could get consistent playing time. And if he hustles and makes a play here or there, there's no reason why he can't put his stamp on the team. So I would probably lean towards him more so than maybe any other rookie because a lot depends on playing time for some of these first-year players outside, of course, of the first two picks, I would say, in the draft. How about you, Danny? I think Allison Smith, I think that's the, the interesting one of him just bulking up from 190 to 260 or whatever it was. Um, I think, yeah, in the long term, that development will be definitely one to watch. So, Danny, tell the folks, what can they expect from Giants.com over the weekend for Rookie Minicamp? Oh, everything. Well, big thing, too, will be the media. It's always, you know, we haven't heard from Coach since the draft. Uh, we'll see what he thinks of the guys on the field. Um, we have phone hour, highlights, which – Lance and Paul did a good job of saying there might not be that many, but at least we'll see them moving around and everything like that. So you'll be watching us on uh, yeah, Jive.com and all of our social accounts, of course. Danny, have a great weekend, my friend. We'll talk to you next week, right, pal? Okay. See Enjoy you, Dan. Hi, Dan.